yeah, we need a uh, some kind of spotlight. Yeah. Uh, no, I. Can you guys hear me? Okay, if I talk loud. Cool. cool. What do you think, John? You okay without a mic? Well, you got this one here. So, all right, sweet. If you need one. Power buttons on the bottom. Okay. Right all right. Thanks. You're welcome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Welcome to Southeast Michigan JavaScript. Uh, if you need the Wi-Fi, the username and password is down there on the bottom of the screen. It's also, I think, written on the whiteboard back there, so, which is where I found it. So there's a few of us that sort of helped make this happen. Uh, my name is Ian. I'm down there on the bottom. John is behind the screen here doing the AV. We're live streaming to YouTube. Uh, and so after this event, it'll be up and ready to go. Uh, if there's any coworkers or anybody who missed it, you can point them there. Um, and then we also have uh, Maddie helps out with jobs. We have a job board that I'll talk about later, or a job email. Uh, and we'll talk also about study group. Um, speakers, Ryan, he's here. He sort of helps out with our, our speaker recruitment and uh, planning. And Matt, I didn't see Matt here, but he handles all of our sponsors who help make this happen. Um, we have a code of conduct. And it essentially is be nice to each other, no harassment, um, uh, don't make fun of each other, things like that. Even if you're using some outdated technology that we all don't like, like that's fine. Like if it's working for you, like we're not going to hassle you. Um, yeah, so check it out at coc.sumjs.org uh, to read all of the details. So the reason we can do what we do here is because we have awesome sponsors that host not only a place to meet, but also some food, uh, because right now it's 6 o'clock and everybody's hungry, and nobody would come to this if we didn't give some kind of food. Um, so today, it's we're here at Pillar. They're one of our longtime sponsors. They've been a, a very good sponsor for us. They always give us great food and a cool place to meet. Uh, do you want to say a few words about, uh, about Pillar and what you do? And, uh, Thank you. Uh, other sponsors we have, we have um, Symphono has provided a lot of this equipment and uh, John's time and expertise to do the, uh, the audio visual. Uh, we will also be giving away two giveaways at the end of the talk. Uh, one will be for a JetBrains license for one year. So anything like PyCharm or WebStorm or PHPStorm, uh, you can pick. And that's a, a free one year license. And then also Green Lancer has provided us with t-shirts. So we'll be giving away a t-shirt as well. Uh, if you or your company are interested in sponsoring, uh, send us a note at sponsors at semjs.org. Uh, particularly if you have a good place to meet. So in May, we'll be looking for a new sort of location sponsor. Um, so if you have a thought of somewhere that can host upwards of 50 people uh, in a good setting, uh, let me know, and I'd be very interested to talk to you. Uh, speaking of upcoming meetings, so we meet the second Monday of every month at 6 p.m. Uh, so you can you can sort of mark your calendars off, whatever Monday is the second one. Uh, and then the location does change. We usually have three different spots that we move around between. Uh, right now we have sort of two standard locations and one that's kind of floating a little bit, hence the comment about May. Uh, next month, we'll be having a talk about source maps and maybe also one more talk. Uh, so if you are interested uh, in giving like a 30 to 45 minute talk, uh, either in April or any other time, really, uh, let me or Ryan know. We're always looking for, for, uh, for speakers. And then May 13 is going to be really exciting. This is uh, going to be a talk about GraphQL with Eve. Uh, she wrote the O'Reilly book about GraphQL. Uh, so I, uh, she's coming from out of town. Where is she coming from? Do you know? Uh, I think in California. Yeah, California, somewhere west coast probably, yeah. 
Cool. So we're real excited to have Eve out in May. So uh, mark your calendars for that one if you're interested at all in, in finding out about GraphQL. Uh, she runs a lot of workshops and things, so it'll be a lot of fun. And again, if you have an idea of a talk either that you would like to see or that you would like to give, uh, hit us up at speakers at semjs.org. Uh, the other thing that we do here at SEMJS is a study group. So that always happens two Mondays after the main meetup. Uh, so the fourth Monday of every month, at, also at 6 p.m. Uh, that location varies between here at Pillar and at Farm Logs. Uh, the upcoming one will be at Farm Logs, but if you're never sure where it is, just look at the uh, meetup.com notice and, and that'll let you know. Uh, Mohammed or Jennifer, are either of you here? No? So I'll talk about it a little bit. It's just a, a more relaxed uh, environment. It's a non-structured, you come with a project or a problem that you've been thinking about, or you come to help other people uh, learn JavaScript. It's sort of a very collaborative um, and uh, informal meeting. Uh, usually no more than, than 30 people, but I think it's usually 20 or so. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not information projection. It's, it's very much more just bringing something to hack on and, and, and uh, talking to other cool people. Uh, another fun meetup in the area is Rochester Full Stack. Uh, Spencer, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Spencer Job. I'm one of the co-founders of Rochester Full Stack. If you're in the area, Rochester, Rochester Hills, um, go ahead and check us out at uh, rochesterfullstack.org. You can also find us on meetup.com. Our meetup's tomorrow night. We meet at the Rochester Firehouse. We go into their big meeting room. They've got a great setup there. Uh, we've got a, a presentation on TypeScript. Should be pretty interesting. We also have some food, so if you're in the area, uh, stop by. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Spencer. Who's getting the talk? Who's that? Who's getting the talk? Uh, Mark Lamarice. Awesome. Does anybody else know of uh, any other cool things going on that the group might like to know about? Yeah. Uh, Angling and Arbor, I think it's next Wednesday. It meets at Cahoots right oh. down on Huron Street. And there's a preview of a talk that's going to be at ng-conf next month, okay. I think. Maybe there. Awesome. So. Yeah. Angular meetup. Check it out on uh, meetup.com, I assume, yeah. right? I know there's also a React meetup. I think they're having their first meetup tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. Uh, so if you're interested in that, that's another cool one to maybe check out. I love that Ann Arbor can support multiple different types of JavaScript meetups. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, I run the Ruby meetup in Ann Arbor. We don't currently have any event scheduled, but we are planning on coming back. Um, so if anyone's interested in Ruby, uh, come talk to me or look us up at the meetup. Awesome. Anything else? All right. So as I mentioned earlier, we do... Uh, have a jobs function at SEMJS. Uh, so the reason that most sponsors are willing to give us a space to meet and some food is they get access to you guys. Um, you know, a lot of people in the area are looking to hire, and uh, one way they can get their name out and, and sort of uh, be actually added to our list of people that we send people to is, is by sponsoring us. So. What, the way this works is if you're interested in a job or you're looking for, for something new, you would send an email to jobs at semjs.org. We'll send you a list of our current sponsors, a little bit of a, a description about each one, and then you can choose to be introduced to one or more of those uh, sponsors. Uh, and in fact, that's how I got my current job. It was my first development job a few years ago and uh, went through the email, got an introduction, and, uh, and it worked. So, uh, so let us know, and uh, we'll be happy to put you in touch with cool companies in the area. So after the meeting, uh, usually about a dozen or so of us uh, get together for afterwards to talk uh, and, uh, and socialize, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so if you have a little bit of time when the meeting ends, uh, walk with us to MASH. It's right underneath Blue Tractor on Washington Street. It's a couple of blocks away. Uh, and if you hang out for a little while, we'll all walk together. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a lot of fun. So we are going to have two talks tonight. One will be a lightning talk. This is a five or ten minute talk. Uh, it's a great way to get started in public speaking and get comfortable with uh, presenting a, a technical topic. Uh, and so if you have a thought or an idea, 
if uh, if you want to come up here and start getting set up, Orlando. Well, I'm, oh, I'm gibbering. Uh, if you have an idea or a talk that you sort of want to want to feel out or uh, maybe an introduction to a topic, this is a great way to do it. So let us know, and uh, and we will give you a slot uh, at the beginning of a meetup, and then. After Orlando, we'll be talking, uh, or Henry will be talking to us about regex, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, anyway, how about we uh, give it up for Orlando? Yeah, just about to say the problem already. Yep, yep. Yep. Dongle life. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, my talk today will be on React hooks. This is my first talk, so. Please be kind. <laughs> There's um, a microphone here if you feel like you need it. If you want to use this, it's up to you. Can everyone can hear me? I was just about to say, can everybody hear me pretty clearly? Okay. Not so well in the back? No. All right, let's, let's try this. All right, booting up. Mm -hmm. All right, try that. Hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay. What am I looking at? He's not on the projector. Nah. Switching over laptops is always a challenge. <laughs> you can probably start the introduction and we'll get it up. Okay. Is it coming up? Well, two things. Hopefully, this will be up pretty shortly. <laughs> two things. My um, I'm gonna breeze through this uh, intro or this um, presentation, because my last run in doing it, which was like about 45 minutes ago, it took me 14 minutes, so I'm gonna try to cram 14 <laughs> minutes into 10 minutes. Um, so if I'm going really fast, please forgive me, and if I miss anything, feel free to ask me, ask me questions mm -hmm. after uh, the presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, my name is Orlando Rue. I've been de developing things on the web for approximately eight years. I've uh, been focused on front-end development for about the past five. Um, uh, my focus has been on web app development for the past three, and pretty new to React the last two years. Uh, I've been working with React. Um, if anybody is curious why I said developing things, because when I first got into web, de web development or this world, it was mostly well, 95% like Flash, Action Script, and I was just developing like banners and things like that. And I did that for like the first two years or so. Um, let's see. I think I went too far. How do I back up? Okay, I got it. Okay. Okay, we'll be talking about hooks. Basically, hooks are functions that you can add to functional components that give you the ability to manage state and component lifecycle, things that you normally could only do with uh, class components. Um, that's how I'll go for this. Goal for today, I'm going to demonstrate the, if you've ever looked at the, the hooks documentation, they basically uh, describe 10 different hooks, but there are three that they re refer to as basic hooks. I'll be uh, focusing on those today because if I went through all of them, it would take me like an hour and a half to um, yeah, and I'm going to try to do it in 10 minutes. So here we are. Okay. Okay. And I probably didn't explain it. I don't remember explaining this. I'm going to take existing class components and convert them into function components while still having the same functionality that they had before with the, uh, with, um, uh, use state and, uh, component lifecycle monitor. All those things. Okay. So uh, to start, oh, let me begin here. What this is doing, this is a simple counter. I'm sure everyone has seen these a million times. Um, yeah, uh, you got the state, the state set to, the counter set to zero. I have a click handler that increments the value one point every time the button is clicked, and that's how that works. Okay, so now to convert it into a functional component and use the hooks to get the same effect. Hold on one second. Get rid of that, convert it into, and I will mess up. 
up. So please forgive me when I'm Okay, get rid of the constructor. I don't need that anymore because it's a uh, functional component. Add you, you state. Yeah, thank you, state. Um, okay, you state returns an array with two values. first value is uh, the current value of the state. And the second value is a function that takes a new value and return that new value and it updates the state. Forgive how I'm explaining this. that I've done, a common uh, pattern that I've found is that people will pass in an, in an object. And with that object, you can then use whatever key you want, name it whatever you want, then set that value there, which pretty much makes it very similar to how state was already set up. So I don't need that anymore. to an arrow function. Okay. Let's see what we got going. Oh, I didn't even need to. All right, start, forgive me for that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I had it. Something else was running on the same port, so sorry about that. Okay, that's what I expect to see. Uh, now, get rid of the uh, render because it's not a class component anymore. Format it correctly. Get rid of this is because it's not um, oh there he is so there that's one down okay This, this is the most time consuming. And again, I'm going to try to breeze through it, hopefully. Okay, what's going on here? Sorry. Use effect. Okay. I'm not going to explain everything that's going on with the entire component, but the key things to focus on here are, with this one, I want to mimic the use, I'm sorry, the component did mount, the component did update, and the, con the component will update, all with the use effect. Um, let's get it started. Okay, here's a, a mess up right here. There should be users populating this area, but I don't know why it's not. But I'm not going to worry about that now. Just imagine that there are users there, and when I click that button, it should it would pick a random user from that um, 
area and like every second it would update that that area with a new user um but we're, we're gonna ignore that and just continue forward um so yeah again i'm mimicking these uh life cycles with user effects so i'll start by again Got to use use state for this one. Don't need the component anymore. I'm gonna add use effect now. No need to explain this. Sorry for the silence. Okay. So now I can get rid of state. <clears throat> also, let me let me count these out for a second. I want to see if I can get just something to show on screen. Where we're at. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. Use life cycle. Okay, I got it. Okay, something was showing. Okay. So now the state is all set up. So now, okay, use effect. Use effect takes two arguments. One is a function that pretty much is what you want to happen. Um, So I'm just going to copy this. And what I'm doing here for this first one is um, I'm mimicking the component did mount. So I don't need this anymore. Why is this not working? Internet disconnection. Oh, well, I'm pulling this data from uh, REST API online. Why is my internet? How can I get internet? Uh, Which guest? Which one? Uh, Forge guest. guest. Okay, I see it. Don't restrain the data Say it one more time, I'm sorry. Uh, What was the last thing you said? I'm sorry. After the Wi Fi things, I think you have cast it for us. Cast for No. AI. AI. Strengths. Does that look right? Okay. 
So now that's in the city. I'm sorry. Hey. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, can I, okay, I know I need to pass the, pass the array into it. State. Okay, so now we should see the current users. And it only, well, it's mounting a lot now because the second the second argument that it accepts is an array, and I forget what it's called. I'm so sorry, but basically that the second value, it checks for a change between what's pa what's passed into that array and what exists in the state. I thought I'm explaining that correctly. Um, if there is a change, it re it re renders the component. If there is no change, it won't. In this case, passing an empty array, it basically looks for nothing. So with that, it w doesn't find anything that changed, so it just will like just mount the one time. So that mimics the component did mount. Um, I'm going to try to do this, the next two all at once. So hold on a second. Use that. And the next one is really simple, so forgive, uh, it won't take nearly as long as this. Here, okay. To mimic component will unmount. Because I may as well do this now. Write a return. Pass function. Don't ex don't ask me to explain this in detail. Because in full disclosure, I'm still kind of shaky on user effect. But the return um, basically says once you're doing whatever in this top part, then do this after you're done. I think. Again, I'm not. Not and since it's set to only run the check one time, or if it's it's not checking for anything, it will only do it once, and only when the component um, is terminated or. So when I leave this page, component I'm on it, go back component. Okay. Use effect. And this is for, uh, of course, component did update. So component moment one time, component did update, and I think it's doing it three times because, well, I think you all know it. When it when the component first loads, it's an empty an, array, an empty array. When it does the component did mount, it goes get grab the data from somewhere and updates the state. Once it updates the state, it counts as a re-render. I don't know what the third one is, but okay. But okay, here is the. This is just to show that the component did update and only that one, just that one use effect is being called. Now, which this is not important, but the, there should still be current users up there, but that's happening because I didn't pass the array. I didn't pass the array here. Yeah, so you're getting that. I mean, the component mounted once, component is updating, and, and ignore that error. I, it, but the, 
point being that the component unmounted. So that's that one. So that's use effect. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. First, let me start it. Okay, just shows a list of users, and it's coming from a provider that I set up like before this talk. Um, okay, so convert it into a. Oh shit, I already did it. Okay. If, if, uh, if it's tough to you know, get it back to rail, then that's fine. Um, I think it's, it's been a good introduction to Jux and how they work. Okay. <coughs> you might literally take a minute. Oh, all right. Uh, you <laughs> yeah. had on too. I didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Literally. Because I did it. I, yeah, sorry. Right. So, okay. I think I can do this in like 60 seconds. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, no need for the render. Don't need this anymore. Use time text. Um, let's pass it and we'll use it. Um, oh, value. in the context, get rid of the wrapper, don't need this either, oh that's it, <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's it, I'm just making it look pretty now. you for uh, tolerating me through my first talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. right. Thanks, Orlando. That's yep. great. Yep, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so if anyone else uh, has an idea for a lightning talk or uh, something that they're kind of interested in, it's a great way to, to learn more about something as well, because when you uh, try to give a talk about it, you sort of have to go through and figure out how things actually work. So it's a, it's a great thing to do. Are you ready? Uh, Henry? All right. We've got handouts. Yeah. Cool. All right, everyone give a welcome to Henry. Yes. Um, this is a interactive learn by doing talk. Uh, I'm still... So, not everybody has a uh, crossword yet, or anybody missing a crossword and a, and a pencil? Okay. So, crosswords in regex land work very similarly to crosswords in a uh, conventional thing. You basically have to make the uh, crossword pass, oh sorry, the, the uh, a test for the regex pass given the fields that you fill in. So we'll be doing one together in just a moment. But 
for now, I'm going to start off by going through some of the basics of what regular expressions are. Uh, my name is Henry Marshall. I'm a developer at Stripe. I work on the migrations team, moving card data in and out of the company. And uh, particularly when we're moving it in, it comes in all sorts of uh, wild and wacky formats. And regular expressions are a fantastic tool for doing um, various different forms of parsing. It's a great thing to have in your toolkit. OK. so. Uh, I'd like to start off by just talking about why you'd want to learn regex. And I'll get into exactly what they can do in a moment. But this, on a high level, they're a really powerful and concise tool for pattern matching. And another advantage is that they are very cross-platform. So it's not just a skill that you're learning now for JavaScript. You're learning it really for the rest of your career as a developer. And you can really rest assured that unlike so much stuff that is changing constantly, regex is here to stay. It's basically not changed since the late 80s. Um, and the core of it has been around since the 50s. And it's really just the best thing around when it comes to doing a very specific task. But that specific task is parsing text. And we're going to be doing that forever. So variance is a, is a great thing to have in your tool belt. So it's a way of describing your patterns. It's also a tool for extracting data. So if you have unformatted text, whether it's natural language or something like a CSV, it's a great way of pulling out various different values. I've, had a, I've been playing around with regex for quite some time. I've written a Chrome extension that lets you do regex search inside the browser, which we'll uh, cover in a little bit more detail now. I've also been using it professionally um, for quite some time. It's Once you have it, you start to see uh, use cases for it in more and more places. So I would caution you not to put it into every place where else you wind up writing Perl. So um, I'd like to start off with just a problem. Uh, one of the common things that you might have to run across, and that is when you have a block of uh, string with multiple lines in it, and you need to split it into different lines. Now, the way that Windows and Unix format uh, multi-line strings is different. So this is abstracted away for us, uh, abstracted away from us, by a lot of great libraries. Um, if you're reading in a file with read line, you're going to be fine. It's going to take care of it. But sometimes you got to do it yourself. And Unix divides things with just a new line, whereas Windows uh, divides things with a carriage return and a new line. A carriage return, if you think back to like old typewriter days, is when the thing slides back over so that you're printing in the left column instead of all the way on the right where you ended the previous column. And so neither of these is really right, but they're different, which leads to a problem. If we split a string just with the normal strict, uh, split method, we, and we use a new line, works great for a Unix string. But for here, we'd wind up with this trailing uh, carriage return. And if we were to always search for a carriage return, then when we didn't have one, it wouldn't split at all. So we can solve this problem with regex. There's a bunch of different uh, ways of specifying whether you want a character to appear one time, many times, a specific number of times. One of the options, which is what we're going to use here, is a trailing question mark. And this means one or zero of a thing. So in this leftmost column, I'm just using A as an example. It could be any character or, as we'll learn, any symbol. And the question mark means one or zero, so it will match an empty string or an A. A asterisk will match is zero or more A's. So empty string, A, 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 and it'll keep going. A plus is similar, but requires that you match at least one. And these are kind of shorthand. There are ways to specify it with exact numbers or ranges of numbers. So a th uh, curly brace 3 closing curly brace will match exactly 3a. You can also specify a range. So this is 2 to 4a right here. And uh, if you were to omit one, so if you were to say a open curly, comma 4 close curly, that would give you 0 to 4. 
And all this is on the other side of your uh, handout, which is the cheat sheet. Now, how can we use that to solve the problem that we had a moment ago? If we have a regex which has backslash r question mark backslash n, the question mark signifies that the preceding carriage return is optional. There's zero or one of them. And so now, when we split, it will split into foo bar in both cases, which is exactly what we want. So this gives us almost all the tools we need in order to solve our first uh, crossword puzzle. And I'll be doing this one um, to, to get started, and then you'll get to solve the second one, and, and we'll keep going. So when we look at this puzzle, we need to figure out what can be in each square so that these regular expressions are true for the columns, and these are true for the rows. So the way that I'm describing this now doesn't really scale, because a regular expression, many regular expressions can describe an infinite number of things. A plus can describe any number of A's. Um, we're constrained to two A's here, because it's a small grid, but we still potentially could have quite a few permutations. But in this case, if we look at this, A star B star. Star means zero or more. So that means that this could be A A, it could be A B, or it could be B B. Those are the only options which would satisfy this. You're not allowed to backtrack, so B A is not a legal possibility. Now if we look at this clue, this says in question mark, that means zero or one m's, b plus one or more b's, and m question mark, zero or one m's. So that means that the possibilities for this are m b or b m because we need to have at least one B in one of the two spots. So if we know that this can be in B or BM, and this can be A or B, then we can conclude that this must be B. And by going through this process, we can actually figure out all of the different cells. So the dot symbol means any character. It's one of the most common uh, symbols in a regular expression, and it can fill in for any character except for new lines. So this actually doesn't really tell us anything. It says there's going to be two characters. Thanks. We knew that. But we'll manage. So we know if this is a B, this has to be a B. Even though we don't have any information from here, we know that this, when we iterated through our options, we could have A, B, or A, A, or B, B. Well, if this is B, the only option for this is also B. So we've got that one solved. Now, uh, when we look further at this combination, we have a M asterisk, that's zero or more M's, and then Q with one or more Q's. So, the options here would become MQ or QQ. Well, Q isn't valid in the, according to this clue. So this has to be an M, and this has to be a Q. All right, so let's see how we did. We got it right. Um, it's good, I made the, uh, the crossword, so it'd be real awkward if I hadn't. Um, but the next one is going to be an opportunity for you to use the uh, regular expressions that you've uh, already learned. It's just about repeating, but I'll put four minutes on the clock or so, and we'll see how people do.
through one, but if you have a question, I will uh, come lend a hand first come, first serve. Just raise your hand. Let's dive into the solution for this one. Uh, if we look at this problem, uh, there's not really any particular reason to start in the top left other than the fact that that's the way we read, but that's where I'm going to go. You often have to jump around a little bit. So I'm going to look here that uh, we've got an R plus. That's really great news because a plus means one or more. So without looking at anything else, we know this has to be an R. There's one or more, and it's at an edge. So this is an R. That means that this could either be an R or a U. And uh, when we look down at this query here, we see that we have zero or more Ts, because of the asterisk, and up to two Us. So if that's the case, we know that R is not one of those letters. So this has to be a U. And if this is a U, this has to be a U. So we've gotten pretty far. Uh, we've got one cell left. We've got uh, the evidence here that the first character could be an R, and the second character, um, that one or two Gs are present. So that means that this has to be a G, because there has to be at least one. So the solution to this puzzle RGUU. Now, just to get a kind of uh, feel for the amount of time that was given, does anybody want wish that there had been less time? Okay, cool. Uh, I'll speed things along just slightly, uh, but not too much. So, I'm going to look now at the idea of character classes, which is the next concept in regular expressions that I want to introduce here. Just spin this around so I can see my notes. So, if you wanted to be able to do a replace in JavaScript, you can always replace with a string. You can replace uh, grandma with family, and that's a perfectly valid thing to do with strings. But if you wanted to replace both grandma and grandpa, there's not a super elegant way to do that without using regular expressions. You could do two replaces. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and you could first replace grandma, then replace grandpa, and that would be fine. But let's see if there's a better way to do that with character classes. Uh, very brief digression it, is that before I mentioned that we had dot as an option, and dot matched any character. So here we have grand dot a, which does match grandma and grandpa. 
but it also max matches grandsaw, which is not one of the words. <laughs> now, generally, when you're working with regex, at least as difficult as actually matching all of the things you care about is not matching anything that you don't care about. <laughs> so making sure that your regex isn't going to match something like grandsaw, even if it's a slightly easier regex to, to write, is important. And the solution to this is what's called a character class. So by denoting in square brackets here both the letters M and P, it means that it will match either of those two letters. So here we have, uh, when we do a replace with grandma and the grandma, it will sub in a family. And when we do a test, test is a method in JavaScript for checking to see if a regular expression matches a thing. If we test for whether the regular expression matches my grandza has a dog, it says false, which is great. That's exactly what we want. The only other thing I'd like to call out with this slide is the letter G here. So with any regular expression, you can apply flags at the end of the command in order to specify certain alternate function. So G is a global regular expression, meaning that it will match every instance in the string instead of just the first one, both grandma and grandpa. There's other ones like I for case insensitive or M for multi-line, and we'll go into those in a bit more depth. But I just wanted to kind of introduce everyone to the syntax, the idea that G here means it's a global thing. And that applies to the whole regex that came before. Character classes are really common, and some of them, some types of character class are even more common, and so there's shorthand ways of denoting them. All of the numbers is a thing that you want to be able to specify really frequently, and having to write this out would be a drag. So you can instead specify ranges over the ASCII character set, so 0 dash 9 matches any of the numbers. In fact, even 0 dash 9 is a bit verbose, so we have backslash lowercase d which matches any digit. Backslash W matches any word character. I'm not sure if that's what the W actually stands for, but that's how I mentally think of it. That's any le uh, letter, A to Z capital, A to Z lowercase, or a digit, or an underscore. And a couple things to note here. One is that I did use a shorthand inside of a character class. Regular expressions kind of have a bit of a reputation for looking like your cat walked across the keyboard, and that's rather deserved. But the good news is, when you split up a regular expression, it's really just a handful of relatively simple components. So you're, and that you are reusing over and over. So backslash D is a shorthand that you learned, and now you can use it here. And that's one way to make sure that to, to deconstruct a regular expression, whether you're trying to find a solution to a crossword or figure out what it is you wrote six months ago. Lastly, I'd like to talk about backslash s. Backslash s is white space. Here we have a uh, space itself, backslash t, a tab, backslash n, backslash r, the new line and character term we talked about before. It also matches some uh, non-ASCII characters, so for example, the non rating space would match the backslash s command. And oftentimes, uh, this is just a, a good tool to have in your, your toolkit if you're trying to search through some sort of thing and you're like, why isn't this matching? Well, it might be the case that what you're searching for is a space and what's actually there is a on breaking space, and if you just use backslash s, it'll match all of those. So once we have a character class, we also can negate the, the contents of said character class. So if we want to have a uh, function that contains non-vowel, you pass in a string and it tells you whether it contains vowel. We want to be able to specify that. Now we could specify every character in the ASCII set that's not a vowel. That's kind of toilsome. So there's a way to negate the contents of a character set. By putting a caret at the beginning of the character set like this. Oh, it's a character class. So we have open square bracket, caret, the vowels, 
close square bracket, we are going to match any character that is not a vowel. That includes things that aren't letters. So seven is an answer to this, right? That's why this is not called contains consonant, uh, which is what I originally called it. But it's really it contains non vowel. And the shorthand negations are actually similar. So we have uh, backslash capital D is the same thing as not backslash D. Capital S, not backslash S, capital, uh, backslash capital W, not backslash W. One other character is the dot. We talked about the dot earlier as the thing that is matching anything. Strictly speaking, it matches things that are not character terms or new lines. We'll talk about how to override that later with a flag. Uh, that's one of the cool new ES 2018 features of regular functions. So back to, back to our puzzles. So we've got a uh, new puzzle here. And I'm going to give everybody, let's say, three and a half minutes this time and see if we can come up with an answer. To so start again in the top left, we know that we've got a digit. We have this black slash did. And we know that the digit can't be 0 to 8, which means that it has to be a 9. So this one here has got to be a 9. If we look then down onto into this cell, we know that this could be a digit because we have backslash d plus, which means one or more digits. And then this is a tricky bit. We've got double backslash, which is escaping the backslash. Uh, this is something that happens in a, in a bunch of different contexts, but happens in regex too. So if we have double backslash, that's a literal backslash, a question mark, which means zero or one. So this number, this cell, could be either a number or a backslash. But if we look at this clue, we have backslash capital W, question mark. That means that 
this cell has to be a uh, a non-word character, which includes digits. So it can't be a digit. It is optional. So before we can rule this out, we have to look at the next thing, because this question mark signifies 0 or 1. This says a non-digit. So regardless of which of these two values it is, this has to not be a digit, which means it has to be the backslash. So we've got a 9 and a backslash. Here, we know that it has to be in the range m through p, so m, n, o, or p. And we know it can't be p, o, g, or m, which only leaves us one character, n. So this has got to be an n. And this, is, uh, because we, we have a one or more at the end, remember that's one of the, we, we, can, we can peg it to the edge, is that this is a non-digit, and the only two things that could be here are k or 6. 6 is a digit, so that has to be a k. There we go. All right. Moving on. This is really where the value of reg x starts to come into its own, is with groups. There's so many things that you can do with groups. So here, we're going to be testing whether something is a theme. And particularly, we're going to be testing whether it's Batman. And so we want to be able to, to check whether we've got all of these repeating NAS. Now, one thing that might come to mind based on the tools that you've already learned in this talk is to use a character class, NA plus. But our actual theme would return true, but the non-theme False, which is what we're looking for. Another thing that we can do in groups is define alternation. So before, we were looking at your grandma and grandpa, which are only different by one letter. And so we were able to use a character class in order to divide between the two. But here, we have to look at your brother and sister, which don't really have an etymological root that brings you to one character uh, in terms of edit distance. So we need a new way to specify things. And the way that we're going to do that is with an, alternating, uh, an alternation in a group. So in, in, just like in JavaScript, the pipe signifies or. So here we have brother or sister, or bitwise or, that's in this line. Um, so here we have a, a group and with a single pipe, we're able to specify brother or sister. And then when we do a replace, we're able to change my brother has a ferret and my sister has a cat to my family has a ferret and my family has a cat, which is exactly what we want. I'd like to call attention again to the fact that we're using a global regex, which is required when you're using replace. Now, there's often more than one way to match a single query. So if we go back to the example of grandma and grandpa from before, we're able to do that with a character class, but we're also able to do that with a group with alternation, just matching a single letter, M or P. This is a little bit less elegant, but gets the job done. And that's really a common theme in regex, is that there is often a lot of ways to do something, some of which might be more performant or more readable. None of them are really readable, it's very nice. But, you know, they can be better or worse. Um, so another thing that we want to be able to do here is do back references. And again, this is why I say groups are so powerful, is that they unlock a ton of the features that, uh, a ton of the flexibility that you have in regex. So if you wanted to have a regular expression, right? that matches foo-foo and bar-bar, uh, but doesn't match foo-bar, if you wanted to be able to have that, you need to really reference what it is that you previously matched, what was earlier in the string. And so, um, I'm sorry, this should be bar-bar. I'm sorry, this should be bar-bar. Um, so the way that you can do that is in your regular expression, you can use what's called a back reference. And this is one of the superpowers of groups. 
anything that was captured in a group, in parentheses, you can refer to later by number. So here we have a capture group. We have open parenthesis backslash w, that means any word character, plus one or more times, close parentheses, <laughs> a literal dash, and then repeat that thing. So uh, here when we have foo foo, foo bar, and bar bar, and we filter it based on the result of this test, we will wind up with foo foo and bar bar, but not foo bar, because we need a repeating. You can also use a kind of similar conceptual idea when you're doing your replacing. So if you have the string, my brother has a ferret, and you want to be able to replace it in a versatile way um, with step, step sibling, whether it's step brother or step sister, you need to capture what it is that you have. And the way that you do that in JavaScript is with a dollar. Dollar one. So when we go up a couple, we see that we were using backslash one when we were in the regex. But if we're using a replace thing, we're going to use dollar one. And that's a way of getting the result from the regular expression out and then being able to reuse that. Capture groups are also great if you're just trying to extract data. So as I mentioned before, I work at Stripe. Stripe costs 2.9% plus 30 cents per transaction. I gave this talk originally at my company. Um, <laughs> if we're going to get the percentage out, we can do a string dot match with the regular expression and pull out the thing in the first position. One thing that's really worth noting with all of these, and you saw it before, is that these are one indexed. Regular expression results, capture groups, are always one indexed. So, here we are going to pull something out, and it's 2.9%. So what is it that we actually managed to pull out? Well, we've got this big regex, and I'm going to break it down, similar to how we've broken down some of the other ones. We've got, first of all, the possibility of 100. I've kind of defined that as the maximum value that uh, a percentage could be. Then we're going to look at an alternation. So it could be 100 or whatever comes after. As I said before, Regular expressions you can often break into little subgroups. And so while it might be intimidating as a big string, you can kind of cut this part off, and now it's a shorter string. Keep going until it's all done. We have a backslash D, that's any digit. And then it's repeated one or two times. So that would be 42 or 2. Then it's followed by a capture, or then it's followed by a group. And the reason that I want to do this group is not because I'm trying to capture the contents of it. It's actually because I want to be able to make it optional. So if I want to be able to capture both 2% or 2.9%, I need to be able to specify that the 0.9 bit is an optional component. So here, I have a backslash dot. Recall that dot can mean any character, but backslash dot is a literal period. Backslash dot, backslash d, that's another digit, so that's the 0.9 plus. So it could also match 2.99. And uh, this, this whole bit with the decimal and the trailing digits is optional as specified by this question mark. Then we, in the capture group, because the capture group is what it is that we're trying to use in order to extract things. And then we have a literal percent sign in order to capture the percent and not, for example, this. And so once we do that and we look in the first index, we get a 2.9 as a string. The zeroth index, just if you're curious, is the entire thing you match. So in this case, it would actually be 2.9% because what we match is from here to here, whereas the capture group did not include the percent sign. One of the cool things with ES2018 is that we have added named capture groups. So if you can imagine you got this really gnarly regex and it's pulling out four variables, that's going to be an absolute nightmare to maintain and just even use in a moment. 
So you almost always wind up naming all of the variables instantly, if only as documentation. But ES2018 gives us a new capability. We can actually name the variables within the regular expression. So here, inside of a capture view, we're going to be, this is uh, breaking out a date in a European style. So we've got date, month, year. Inside the capture group, we specify, if we have a leading question mark, Question mark is one of the most overused characters in regular expressions. It has a lot of meanings. Inside of a capture group at the very beginning, it usually denotes that this capture group is somehow special. Here it's going to be saying that we've got a variable uh, or a, a named capture group. And inside of angle brackets, we write day. And again, later we write month and then year. And then when we parse the string, Apollo 11 landed on the moon on 20 slash 7 slash 1969, it's able to pull out as part of this groups object day, month, and year, which is a lot cleaner. And I use date in specific in this example because a lot of times with dates, if you need to work with you know, uh, data sources that are both have European dates and American dates, it can be very confusing. And so having a way of labeling stuff immediately means that you're less likely to wind up accidentally inverting things and then causing yourself headaches later on. Now, JavaScript's a bit weird. So, you, if you look here, um, when, we, when we start off and we do a match, we get back this match object, which has R. I'm matching a non-global thing, there's no G trailing this, and I'm matching B, A, and any letter. I get bar, index zero, the input was bar baz, all good so far, groups undefined. Groups, if we go back to this slide, groups is the named groups that was added to ES2018. If you're using an older version of JavaScript, you won't have anything uh, on that part of the object. All right, so far so good. That was an entirely reasonable result. <laughs> BA, open parenthesis to open a capture group, backslash W, close capture group. Also a reasonable result. Here we have the capture group in the first index. As I said, that's always where you can expect to find these. Here's where stuff starts to go off the rails. If we have BA backslash W, but we make it a global regular expression, you might expect to get an array of the thing that you get when you normally do the search, but you don't. Instead, you get the entire match, and it throws away the, here uh, you, you get the entire match. So you just get um, bar and then bats. Where it really gets ugly is when we have a capture group and a global thing, we throw away the result of the capture groups, which is unfortunate because you might expect to be able to work with them. The other thing that's unfortunate is that if you match something that's not there at all, you get null instead of an empty array. So you really have to kind of do some error handling manually here because that's three different object types and none of them have any relationship to each other. But such is life. What you can use is exec, which maintains an index the location in the string that you're searching. This is the best way to extract various different capture groups all from a single string. And so here I've defined a function all matches. It's going to take a regular expression and a string. And what we're really doing here is we are looking at, we're, we're getting each match and we are going to wrap it and push it onto this match list and then return the match list. And that gets us something that's kind of the shape that we'd be able to expect and we'd be able to iterate over it, look at each of the uh, capture groups that we have, do all the things that we might want. Probably not worth a dependency, but there's a library called xregx, which Back before ES2018 offered a lot of the great features that uh, regular expressions lacked in JavaScript, 
now really their only value add, in my opinion, is that they have a lot of nice syntactic sugar for stuff like this. But that is a, a great library and it made things a lot easier for many years. One thing that's also worth noting, if you pass a non-global regular expression in here, you're going to get an infinite loop. That's bad. <laughs> so, I mentioned before that you've got the idea of dots, and that you want to be able to capture a whole bunch of different stuff with dot. One of the things that it can't do normally is capture line returns and new lines. It captures everything else. In ES 2018, there is a S flag that you can add to a regular expression that makes dot capture everything. And this is really useful for being able to capture multi-line uh, values. So here I want to have an example that might seem contrived at first. Why are you parsing your code with a regex? But I promise, it actually is exactly what your syntax highlighter is doing. And it's what's highlighting this code right here. It's what's highlighting it in your editor of choice. It's how basically every editor works. So here we have some, a bit that's code, a bit that's a common, and then some more code. And we want to be able to extract the common. And we're going to use this regular expression to do it. So here, if we break this down, we've got a backslash slash. That's just a forward slash. Forward slash ends the right x. So if you didn't escape it, bad things would happen, even though it's not, strictly speaking, a meta character. Then we have a literal asterisk, so we have to escape that too. Then we capture a period. And uh, I'm sorry, we would need to repeat this. So it would be a period plus, or a period asterisk. And then uh, we have this, the closing of the comment. And so we're able to then pull out, this is a comment, this too. And we then can color that, and that is how a syntax highlighter works. And if you notice that there is a problem with your syntax highlighter, something's not showing up in the right color. It's almost certainly just a regex fix. And they're really easy PRs. So um, feel free to uh, help improve your editor. And uh, it is worth noting that this uh, S flag is a very new thing. It's only in ES 2018. So if you're looking at existing regular expressions, or your crosswords, as you'll see, um, you might see this pattern, which is a character class with a lowercase, backslash a lowercase letter, and then backslash its capital. So here we just have backslash, back, I'm sorry, backslash lowercase w, backslash uppercase w, which means, because of the negation rule earlier, a word character or a not word character, which is all the characters. So, before we had the S flag, that was really the best way to specify things. And you could do it with any letter. It could be backslash D, backslash capital D, or S's, or whatever. I'm just using W as an example. Other times, dot does too much. So before, here, we were looking at things where dot doesn't do enough, and we need to apply that, that S flag. Here, we're looking at times where it does too much. So if you look at this, say we are parsing a weird config file that somebody created. Foo equals the string foo. All right, great. So if we are trying to pull stuff out of double quotes, we want to capture the values. We're going to have open double quote, the begin of a capture group, dot period, close the capture group, double quote. Seems great. And in fact, when we test it, it is great. Pulls out foo. Here we've got the full match, which includes the double quotes, and then here we've got just the single match, but like the actual match group. And it's working really well. All right, let's let's uh, keep going. Mind you, this all matches here is just that function that we defined earlier uh, that kind of gives you a more intuitive return type. Um, here we are past this. Foo equals foo, bar equals bar. 
when we apply this, we want to get foo and bar as the two match groups, but we don't. And in order to be able to understand why it is that we return, that we actually get from here all the way to the end, we have to kind of think about what the regular expression engine is doing. How is it matching stuff? So what happened is we started out with this double quote, matched it. Or it started out here, and it was like, nope, 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 matched it. Brilliant. Then we started the capture group, and we found any character. All right, any character. I can do this. I'm going to repeat multiple times. All right. I got an F. I got an O. I got an O. I got a double quote. That's any character. That, that makes me happy. I got a comma. B-A-R equal double quote. B-A-R double quote. Keeps consuming everything. It's greedy. Then it wants to match a double quote. And it says, oh, there's no more letters left. What am I supposed to do? Well, it backs up. It, it moves backwards and it jumps back here and then retests that last letter. It goes, oh, double quote. Brilliant. Done. That's how you get your result. That's not what you want, though. What you wanted is to have foo and bar as separate capture groups. It's kind of two ways to approach this. My preferred way is to use caret and a double quote, which says match anything that's not a double quote because I know that the next thing that I want to be as kind of the delimiter is a double quote. So this is a really common pattern where you're going to match from like opening symbol to not the closing symbol and then the closing symbol. That's a great way of doing this. The other way is with something called laziness. Laziness is signified with a question mark because the question mark always needs more things to do with the next. But it's and so you'd put it right after the, the plus sign here, and it would denote laziness, and it would take as little as it could in order to still match. <laughs> so with all that in mind, let's uh, kick it up a notch to a 3x3. Three three. So uh, I'm going to give five minutes for the 3x3, three three, because it takes a bit more time.
let's look at how this regular expression, uh, or this crossword, is constructed, and see if we can figure out the answers. So, you know, I'm going to start at the top left, no particular reason, it's just where I like starting. We've got this first cell that needs to either be a four or a question mark. And if we, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a total lie. I'm, I'm glad you all caught me. Um, it needs to be either zero or one fours. Um, and we know that we need to have a digit here. So that means that this needs to be a one. So that's uh, our first starting point. Now if we look down at this cell, that can be any character as denoted by this dot. That doesn't really help us with this FA ZBM uh, option. And this next cell could be, needs to be the same as what was here, but we don't have any clue from here because that's just a backslash W. So we've only got four in this column. Not going so well. Here we've got any character. So that's going to be a, a little bit of a question. But if we look at this row, we know that we need to have at least one C. So that has to be a C. <laughs> and uh, that's a good place to be starting. If we look here, we don't know whether this is going to be a C or a K yet because uh, when we, we just know that it is not a digit, which isn't very helpful. Now, if we look in this cell here, we see that it needs to be a digit. And so we know that that's a 6. But even before we knew that that was a 6, we know that that leaves only two spaces here in order to be able to fill this in. So it can't be ZBM because this one is occupied. So it has to be an FA. So we've got an F and an A here. Now, if we have an F here, and remember this clue earlier, we captured an F, so that's also an F. <coughs> If we are going back to this cell, uh, <coughs> sorry, yeah, so if we're going back to here, um, we are knowing that this backslash dollar sign is literally a dollar sign, so that's a gimme, nice and easy one. And then here we know that we have either the letter A, B, or C. We don't actually know which letter it is based on this clue right here. It's a capture group. But we know that it also needs to be what's in this cell. And we can keep tracking this back. So if we need to know, we know it's in this cell. This doesn't help us, but this does. We know that it has to be either a C or a K. The only option here is a C. So that means that this is a C, and this is a C. And I think that that's every cell. So there we go. All right. Oh. So uh, next thing I want to do is kind of break down one of the common regular expressions that we often see. Um, it's matching email addresses. And um, I have a particular affinity for this because bad regular expressions catch my email address all the time. I have one of the novelty domains that you can get now from Henry at is a goddamn dot ninja. And <laughs> there's so many things that try to limit you to three characters as the, as the TLD. Um, you can construct one in Rubular or HiFi, which is uh, one for JavaScript. I like the uh, Rubular creator so much that I use that even when I'm doing things for JavaScript because, again, regular expressions are really quite cross-platform, which is one of the reasons that they're such a great skill to pick up. So this is, I would say, this is my favorite of the regular expressions that match email addresses. And we're going to break it down into various different sections. So as I said uh, before, and I think as you're starting to see with the crosswords, even complex regular expressions are really just composed of the same simple parts. Here we have a big mouthful, uh, but it's really not too bad once you have divided it into a bunch of small sections. We've got a character class, which matches any word character. A literal period. That's kind of a weird thing. Normally, dot means 
in a character, but not in a character class. In general, in character classes, things are considered their literal meaning, the, the literal version of them. So a dot is a dot, a dollar is a dollar, and so on and so forth. That said, you generally, and you are in JavaScript, and in generally in most languages, you're allowed to over-escape things. So in your character classes and in a number of other places, it might not be necessary to actually escape certain characters, but you'll almost never be penalized for doing so. So when in doubt, do that, but it's also something to be aware of when you're trying to fiddle with stuff. Got a literal percent sign, a literal plus sign. Again, that's one of the characters that normally has a special meaning, but doesn't here. And a literal dash. Interestingly, dash does have a special meaning in certain contexts inside of a character class. Remember before ranges, zero to eight? That has a special meaning, but because it's not between two characters, which you could interpret as a range, it doesn't. That's, yeah. So, all right, we've got, we've got this, and we're going to want one or uh, more of these letters. And they can be in, yeah, one or more of these letters as signified by the plus. Then we've got our literal at sign. Then we've got a uh, capital A to Z, 0 to 9, period, and dash. These are the things that are allowed in a domain. These are repeated. We then have at least, and then we have a period followed by your top level domain. Please don't put a three here or I can't use your website. It makes me very sad. Um, and then finally, we've put an I at the end. This is one of the flags that I mentioned in passing before, but it's the case insensitive flag. So all the times that we were constructing here, we were just using capital letters, capital A to Z. And that's because we knew we'd want to have this I at the end. Now. This brings us to an interesting security question. A lot of times you're using regular expressions in order to validate an input. And once you've done that, you feel like you can trust it. But somebody comes along and they do some code injection. They write script alert, uh-oh, close script. Then they use backslash n fluidbar.com. Now, if we use the regular expression from the previous page, we can create a te uh, function that contains email. And we can check here whether something contains an email. And this does contain an email. So we would say true. And if you were to then save this in your database and trust this string and put it into a field where you're expecting some user's email address to be, it could inject code into your site. And that's bad. You want to be escaping your stuff anyway, but this is you know, multiple, multiple checks. Try to get things as secure as you can. The, what you really want to do here, though, is not check that this contains an email, but check that it is entirely an email, that there's nothing else here. So the way that you do that in regular expressions is by putting caret at the beginning, which means the beginning of the string. The very first character, it, it, it's, it's a zero width thing, so it's, before the beginning of the string, it's checking if, if that is the beginning, rather than actually matching it. And then likewise, at the end, we have a dollar sign, which matches the very end of the string. Um, if you use certain editors, uh, like Vim, caret and dollar also moves you to the beginning and end of the line. That's kind of the I think, inspiration for those bindings, is that it's in regular expressions in this way. So, this will match a true fooitbar.com, but not the injected fooitbar.com. So generally speaking, you, if you do want to match the entire string, you should use the caret and dollar. Now, as a brief aside, if you did actually want to match uh, just specific lines so that you wanted to look at this backslash n and be like, oh, from here to here is a line, you can do that by put it using the multi-line uh, flag. If you put an M at the end of the regular expression, it would know that what you want to do is consider the f uh, file a single line at a time, and then the result of that would be that you could use the 
carrot and dollar multiple times, which is useful in certain circumstances. Okay, so I've mentioned a couple times about how question marks are a bit confusing. I'd just like to call out here that now caret has two purposes as well. You've got carrots to mean the beginning of the string, as we just talked about, and then we already introduced how carrots also mean inside the context of a character class, not the other letters in this character class. So now we have met all of the meta characters in regular expressions. These are everything. Uh, I think there's 14 of them, and generally speaking, you can always escape them. Sometimes you don't need to. So one of the last cautionary things I'd like to be flagging is that regular expressions often fail silently. You really should test them, whether it's manual testing at the time of writing or through automated testing. If you look here at a regular expression that is correctly created, we've got ABC, character class, repeated two times, followed by XYZ, repeated one or more times. So we're going to match CBZ, because we have two letters here, followed by one. And we won't match AXX, and we won't match A. Here, we've made a typo. Looks very similar, but I've just replaced the closing square bracket here with a curly. We're not going to get any syntax error because that is a perfectly valid regular expression. And we're probably not going to get any clue in our editor because most editors don't have syntax highlighting in their regular expressions. But the result of this is that from here to here is all one big character class repeated one or more times. So not only are AXX and A going to match, but so is open square bracket and two. That's definitely not what we want. And this brings me to the point about testing. You generally want to test what doesn't match at least as well as you test what does match. It's really tempting to be like, oh, I've now matched all the things I want. That took me way longer than I thought for something that's 15 characters. Um, and try to move on. But testing your negative conditions is super important. So this kind of brings us to where do you want to use regular expressions? You can use regular expressions, of course, in your code, as we've been talking about here. You can also use regular expressions in your editor in order to move around through text, to do find and replace, things of that nature. Just about any text editor that you use has replace functions, just like the JavaScript things, which allow you to interpolate values from your capture groups, which is super helpful for renaming and all sorts of stuff. You can also use it in word processors. In one of the latest ships of Google Docs, they added regex support, which is awesome. Uh, they have it both in their uh, Google Sheets as well as Google Docs. Works great. Um, really satisfying. Um, you can also use it in PDFs. So uh, finding stuff in PDFs is, uh, can, can be a real pain. There are open source tools. Um, PDF grep is a fantastic command line tool, as well as some GUI options for Windows. I mentioned at the outset that I created a Chrome extension for doing uh, regular expression searching. It's called Deep Search. It supports the ability to match any sort of um, regular expression so that you might want to search here. You're matching um, instances of millions and billions with numbers. Um, it also lets you search not just the page that you're currently on, but also linked pages. So it will Ajax request every document that's linked on a page um, and do regex searches there. You'll be able to download all this data as CSV. Um, it's really for extracting data from websites which don't have great APIs. <laughs> um, another great place to use it is, uh, to use regular expressions, is on the command line. So grep is one of the famous tools for, uh, famous Unix tools. It lets you filter by default based on line. It'll just filter out any lines that don't match regular expressions or strings. If you are using grep, uh, and grep is a fantastic tool for, for doing exactly that. Um, it's not a great tool for iterating over all the stuff in a directory. So if you're trying to find files 
that are somewhere in your directory. Grep is not aware of things like your git ignore. It's not aware of the fact that binaries definitely don't contain the strings that you're looking for. And so it's not very quick. And if you have ever spent time after running a grep command, twirling your thumbs, waiting for it to be done, you owe it to yourself to look into the silver searcher, uh, also known as AG. It's like literally orders of magnitude faster. And you can do all sorts of cool shenanigans, like not build up indexes for stuff that you're searching for your editor's autocomplete. It's great. Um, highly recommend AG. One place not to use it is to parse HTML. So there's a fantastic Stack Overflow post about what happens <laughs> if you try to parse HTML using regular expressions. And the takeaway is that you summon that guy, and it's real bad. Um, you know, it's tempting to do it for occasional one-off things. If you have a super constrained uh, domain, maybe it's okay, but it's not a replacement for a true XML parsing engine. XML is just too complicated. Uh, regex is not the right tool for you. So from here, I'd like to just kind of wrap stuff up. Quickly like to talk about flavors of regex. So there are a bunch of different versions they're all very similar, and almost everything that I've covered tonight, with the exception of some of the ES 2018 stuff, is the same across every language, probably that you will ever write code in for the rest of your life, which is awesome. Uh, one of the few exceptions is that back references have a different leading symbol in different languages. Just a thing to know, um, easiest, pie to, uh, easiest pie to look up, but um, it is a little bit of a variable. And uh, as I mentioned, yeah, look around. Some of the 2018 stuff um, is not necessarily useful. So we've done a few regex crosswords. I created these, but there's a bunch online. Uh, the MIT crossword was the original uh, creator of this meme. Definitely worth checking out. It's very challenging. There is a great site called regexcrosswords.com, which has a ton more regex and highly recommend that. There's also an Android app, which I believe programmatically comes up with the puzzles. So on the plus side, there's infinite. On the downside, there's not quite as many uh, clever balances where you're bouncing around the regex in order to try to solve it and stuff like that. Um, but it's great. And I still prefer them to Sudoku and stuff like that. Love regex. Um, so next steps, a few things I want to mention. One is that ES2018 added robust Unicode support. So everything we talked about today was ASCII. And of course, we have to be able to process every different language. And that includes things that are digits, clearly, but aren't 0 to 9 in the like, Arabic numeral set. And so if you want to be able to match those with regular expressions, there's a bit of reading that I would recommend you do, but it's great. We have other things that uh, groups can do, non-capturing groups, uh, look-aheads, look-arounds. All that stuff is fantastic. All of it is supported in JavaScript. Highly recommend you look it, out, uh, look it up. We also have laziness, which I mentioned really in passing about a way to not capture everything when we were looking at the dot that was consuming the entire rest of the string. If you had it be lazy, it would consume as little as possible and can be a really handy tool. So for resources, uh, all of th this whole talk has been uh, full of links. And you are able to uh, go here at bit.ly, uh, bit regex101, get the whole talk. The handout is here. Uh, we also have regularexpressions.info, which is, I would say, one of the it's kind of the canonical book. It's a website, but it's a canonical book of how uh, to do regular expression things. This is a great talk in uh, a great article in Smashing Magazine about the changes that are coming in ES 2018. Jeff Atwood absolutely adores regex, so if I haven't convinced you that they're worth learning, um, perhaps get, let him take a shot at it. And then finally is awesome regex. There's awesome lists for all sorts of stuff. A lot of you have probably seen them, but they're basically just great resources. If this slide were longer, I would just be reiterating the stuff that they have. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Henry Marshall, and 
I'm an engineer at Stripe. We are always hiring, so if you're interested in trying to find a position, we're very remote friendly, and come talk to me after. Thank you.